Greetings from St. Mark's United Methodist Church. I am Pastor Ted Bible, and it's good to have you with us again this week as we uh, are wrapping up our the sermon, short sermon series, three-week series on um, the parable of the prodigal son, the parable of the lost son, the story of the bereaved father, the, the parable of the uh, elder brother or elder son. Whichever way you want to look at it, we're wrapping that up today. And yes, I know this is Mother's Day weekend, but let's just be honest for a second and realize that, you know, um, some people haven't always had a great relationship with their mother. Likewise, this story today, some people don't have a great relationship with their father, but we all have an opportunity to have a wonderful, loving, and great relationship with our God. And that is the focus of this message today is about the wonderful redeeming love of our God. But before we get to that, I just want to once again just invite you, if you have any prayer requests that you would like for us uh, here at the church to be in prayer for you over, celebrate with you the joys or, or pray with you over the concerns, we'd be happy to do that. And all you need to do is send us those email requests to limastmarks at gmail.com, limastmarks at gmail.com, and we would be happy to be in prayer uh, for you and with you. So today, uh, again, once again, we're just looking at the Gospel of Luke and in chapter 15, and the uh, parable is covered uh, from verses 11 through 32. So first of all, let's just kind of just do a summary here of, of the first uh, of verses 11 through 20. And what, we've, what we remember is that the younger son came to his father and he said, Father, I want to have my inheritance. Give me my inheritance. And so the father does that. This is a very unusual request that the son had made. Usually it's, you know, inheritances aren't, aren't distributed until, until, the, until the father or the parent passes away. But in this case, he wanted it early. For some reason, he wanted that money and he wanted to get out of town. He wanted to leave home. He was frustrated over what had been taking place at his household, his position in the family. He just, for whatever reason, he wanted to leave. And we can all kind of relate to that. We, perhaps you've been that way. Perhaps you know someone who just, you know, as soon as they got old enough to leave the house, was, uh, they wanted to leave town. They just had to get out, find another place to live. They wanted to declare their independence. They wanted to leave wherever it was that they were at, their home. And that's what this young man did. He took everything he had. He left nothing behind, no nest egg, nothing like that. He took it all behind and he left. And he went and hired himself out to a citizen, we're told, of another nation, which means he was hired out to, to a Gentile. And as a result of that, he found himself working at a pig farm, a terrible place for a Jew to work. And he actually longed at one point then to be able to eat the food that the pigs were eating because he was so hungry. And then we're told that he came to his senses. He realized that even his father's hired hands had it better than he did. And so he made up the, he made the decision to, to go home, to travel back home and to go up to his father and to tell him that, you know, father, I no longer deserve to be considered your son. Hire me back as a servant and let me work for you. And then in verse 20, we're told that, but while he was yet a distance, his father saw him and had compassion and he ran. And he ran and he embraced him and he kissed him. Jesus is telling us that the love of the father was still very strong. Imagine with me, if you will, what it must have been like for that father to wake up every morning, to look out over, over the distance down the road and to wonder if today, perhaps, might be the day for his son to come home. He's wondering about his health. He's wondering about his well-being. He's wondering if he's got a job. Is he safe? Is he secure? And then once again, then at night, before he goes to bed, he goes back outside. He looks up at the glorious stars in the heavens, realizing that somewhere out there, his son is laying under those stars. And he wonders, is he safe? Did he have food to eat that day? Is he warm? And I wonder if perhaps he will be coming home tomorrow. And as the weeks turn into months and the months turn into years, the father's love never wavers. It remains strong. But while he was yet in the distance, his father saw him, he had compassion on him. I think the word compassion is very important here for us. We know that the word compassion means a feeling of sorrow for someone suffering. And it's an act of feeling sympathy for someone as well. 
The father saw his son far off in the distance, and he could tell that he was coming home worse off than he, than he was when he left. The father could assume from what he could see of his son that misfortune had, been fall, had befallen him. He could tell from what he could see that the inheritance was gone, that he had no more money. He was, he was in a desperate situation. But you know, the father doesn't care. The father doesn't care. From a distance, he could see that his son is in trouble, and the father ran to him, which was very uncommon in that time and in that culture because elders, fathers, they, they didn't run. It was undignified, but he didn't care what other people thought. He ran to his son. He embraced him. He held him tightly. He longed for his son to return home, and now the father is celebrating. He, he's thrilled that his son has finally come home. You know, the love of our Father, our God in heaven, is like that. No matter what we have done, His love remains strong and His love remains never-ending. The Old Testament is full of examples of, of God's willingness to extend His grace to people and to nations who have betrayed Him. You will recall the story of Jonah. And God told Jonah to go to the people of Nineveh and to warn them, to warn them to, to repent. These were evil people, and Jonah had nothing, wanted nothing to do with them. He wanted God to punish them. He wanted God to destroy them. But God showed mercy on them, and Jonah finally went. He declared the message, and the people repented. And Jonah even said to God, he said, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I, when I was still at home? This is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish, why I ran away, why I didn't want to do what you told me to do. I knew. That you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Like the younger son, we too can be demanding and we too can be independent. Sometimes we feel that we need our freedom and that we can run our lives just fine without the help of God. For a while, things may go pretty well. We are in control. We're happy. We're healthy. We feel like we're in control of our lives as best we can be. Everything is going fine. But in the process of gaining our freedom, we have distanced ourselves from God. Perhaps we're no longer going to church regularly. Perhaps we, have, we are no longer meeting with our small group or our accountability group, our Christian friends. Perhaps you know, we've, we are no longer, or we've certainly cut back on our prayer time as well as our Bible reading time. Perhaps we've even now gone as far as we're gossiping about people. We're poking fun at them. Or perhaps we've decided now that material items are so much more important to us than our responsibilities to our God and to our family and to our church. We are now caring more about ourselves and how we can impress our friends than we are about showing Christian love to others. We have fallen short. We have fallen short of living a Christian life. But Jesus tells us that his father was glad to welcome him home, that his parent was glad to welcome him home. The father ran out to welcome him. He embraced him and he kissed him. His son was alive and had come home. The father didn't care about the inheritance. He didn't care about what had, what had, been, what had happened in the past. None of that was important. What was important was that his son had returned home. So not only did the father show his son compassion, but he also showed him mercy. It would have been his legal right to treat his son harshly, and no one would have thought any lesser of the father. But instead, he showed him mercy. Even though he didn't deserve forgiveness and mercy, he received it. He received it from his loving father. Verse 21, notice that the son didn't even get to finish telling his father what, what, he, what, what he would do. He didn't get to tell him that to make me one of your servants. His father cut him off and, and, and he told his servants to, to go and bring a robe for my son, which is a symbol of honor and the best robe he told him to bring. And who has the best robe? The father has the best robe. And his servants were also told to bring a ring, a ring for his hand, which symbolized authority. And they were told to bring him sandals, sandals for his feet, which symbolized that he was his son, an important member of the family. He was not a servant. And he told them to kill the fatted calf and to hold a celebration. 
For his son, who was once dead, is now alive. He had been lost, and he is now found. The son had returned home and has been restored to be a valuable member of the family, and that was cause for celebration. My friends, we can find comfort today in knowing that our Heavenly Father, our God in heaven, is always willing to take us back when we have gone astray. With love, compassion, mercy, and grace, our God is willing to forgive and forget our mistakes of the past. He will welcome us back home to his kingdom, where, he will be, where we will be restored to our position as a child of God. This then leads us to to the father's relationship with the older brother. And in that portion of scripture, the father goes out to the son and he calls him back because his son had heard, had, had retur was returning home and he asked the servant, what's all this noise? What's all this music? What's all this celebration I hear? And the servant tells the older brother, he says, your brother has returned home. Your father is celebrating. It's cause for celebration, it's joy. And he became angry and wanted nothing to do with it, and he refused to go into the celebration. And now, once again, the father goes out to a son, this time to the one who has been faithful and loyal to him. He has gone out to persuade the older son to celebrate the return of his younger brother. But despite the father's assurances to the older brother, we are told that we don't know how the story ends. We don't know what the, whether the older brother went back or not. And the story ends this way because that is the decision that each and every one of us has to make. If we stay outside and away from the celebration, then we reject God's grace as a rule, as a rule of life in the family and in the church. But if we go into the celebration, then we accept God's grace as the rule of life and the rule of the family. Our takeaway from this final week of this study on this parable asks us the all-important question. What is the picture of God that we find in this story? What is the picture of God that we find in this story? And as we seek, the, seek this, the answer to this question, let's first acknowledge that our relationship with God is like the relationship of these sons with their father. Sometimes it's true that our relationship is broken with our God. Our relationship is strained. Our relationship is one-sided. God, on the other hand, is committed to restoring the relationship with you and with me. And as we read in, in, in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, he is willing to go to great lengths to restore that relationship. This is a scripture that many of you know very well, but let's, let me tell you and read it to you one more time. Jesus said these words, For God so loved the world, that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So what is the picture of God that we find in this story? We find a God who doesn't give up on his children. We find a God who is full of grace. And do you remember from last week what the definition of grace was that I provided you? God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. If you find that the struggles of life are starting to get you down, take a good look at yourself and do what the young man did, the younger son did, and come to your senses. If you find that you have drifted away from your home and perhaps deliberately or perhaps deliberately ran away from home, then now is the time to recommit yourself to Christ and to return home. If you find that your ability to run your life absent of God is not going so well, once again, now is the time to return home. God is waiting for you. And his arms are open wide. He's ready to embrace you and welcome you home as a child of his. His grace is sufficient to cover your sins of the past. God is longing to have a homecoming celebration for you. He's ready to greet you. Go home to God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, by your grace, 
You have washed away our sin through the blood of Jesus Christ, your sacrifice for our sin. We confess that we have not loved and served you as we should, and that we have too often placed our own selfish desires before obedience to your word. Lord, we admit that we have done many things that are unworthy of your name, but thank you that in Christ Jesus, all of our sins have been washed away. We thank you that you are a gracious and forgiving God. We are grateful that your memory of our past sins will be wiped away forever when we come before you and when we ask for forgiveness. We praise you today and every day for your amazing grace and for your amazing love. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. But once again, I just want to say thank you for your prayer support and for your financial support of the ministries here at St. Mark's. And uh, if you would like to support us financially, you may do so by mailing your gift to St. Mark's United Methodist Church, 1110 North Metcalf Street, Lima, Ohio, 45801. Or you can go online to our website at limastmarks.com, limastmarks.com. Scroll down on the homepage a little ways, you'll find a link that says Give Now. Click on that, and that will walk you through step-by-step step, the easy process of making an online gift. And as always, we do, uh, if you're in the Lima area, you're invited to come and be a part of our worship service. We'd love to have you come and be here. And um, uh, we worship on Sunday mornings at, uh, at 10.15. So you're welcome to come and be a part of that. We would love to, to meet you and, and, and invite you into our fellowship. So until next time, I pray God's blessing to be upon you. And again, if you have found yourself distanced from God, then I invite you and I encourage you to return home. Go in peace.